So good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the next uh, PBEC Roundtable Dialogue Webinar Series 2020. We'll be getting started in just uh, a minute or so. We'll just wait for more people to, to log on. So we'll give it a minute. Thank you. Okay, so a um, couple of minutes past the hour, so we'll, we'll get started and let uh, other people join as they uh, log on. So for those who have joined already, good morning and uh, welcome once again to the next uh, Pacific Basin Economic Council Roundtable Dialogue webinars, webinar series of 2020. And today we're going to be covering um, real estate again. We looked at this back in April and uh, Eli, who I'll introduce, reintroduce for some of you in a minute, uh, was on that panel. So maybe he can draw some uh, comments that he made back then to see if they've changed at all now in the wider aspect of real estate and uh, his own business uh, in terms of uh, the COVID recovery period. But um, in addition to that, we've got some wonderful other panelists joining us today, experts in their respected field. And we're really looking at a more deeper dive subsector of real estate today. So we're going to be covering co-living and the first two presenters are really looking at defining the uh, the whole sector first and foremost, so give people a, a refresh. And then we'll be hearing about latest real estate transaction activity, uh, what effects you know, the continuous lower interest rates are having. Uh, then we'll take uh, a more interesting look and a sort of benchmarking how Australia's market is performing in this subsector and some of the opportunities and maybe some of the uh, challenges that still exist to attract investment um, versus some of the other markets that uh, Regina will cover as well a little bit. So we'll be looking at also how prop tech, I mean technology in any sector in this COVID recovery period is really um, seeing a a lot of interest. I think as people have had more time on their hands, they're reassessing their workflows, their systems, and looking at upgrading. And it's no different in the real estate, I think, uh, both, both from a policy perspective, where there needs to be lower carbon, lower, uh, you know, higher sustainability factors in the, the whole build process, um, but also the demographics that are changing uh, with either the pandemic, but also the new generation Z coming through and their expectations. So shifting trends and patterns will be looked at. Uh, migration, how that's been uh, affected in the short term anyway, with some of the border lockdowns uh, across the region, how's that affecting uh, property sector, especially the rental sector. Uh, we mentioned obviously sustainability, environmental concerns, and then finally, we'll be looking at the policies, in particular around Australian states and federal policies, incentives for investors, international investors to look at this space and the build to rent sector uh, and how the equity capital markets are in terms of uh, liking this as well and debt. So a lot to get through. And the format today is going to be a series of mini presentations from each of the panelists. So we've got some really rich content to share with you in the beginning. Um, obviously, feel free as some of you are now fully uh, familiar with Zoom, this is Zoom webinar, you have a bar, you've got um, obviously a chat function, uh, well actually no, yeah, I haven't got a chat function today, sorry, but uh, the Q&A there if you want to uh, send in your questions. I'll, t as moderator, Michael Walsh today, uh, PBEX CEO, I'll be uh, prioritizing which questions uh, we'll be putting to the panelists and um, you can vote them up as well yourselves if you want one question to be asked over another first. So hopefully we'll have a, a good 15-20 minutes towards the end uh, to take those questions but without further ado I'm going to hand over in the first instance to Eli uh, Convitz of Atkins. So Eli 
can I uh, hand over to you, my friend? Thank you. By all means, thank you, Mark. Can you hear me okay? Mike. Mark. Yeah, perfect, Eli. Yeah. Mark's name on the screen. <laughs> Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, hello, I'm Eli Kondlitz, and I'm a city planner and an urbanist working for Atkins. Atkins is a global design, engineering, and project management consultancy. From our Hong Kong headquarters for Asia Pacific, I take care of our urban development and master planning practice uh, for Southeast Asia, and I also chair our global urban planning network. Um, I thought I'd share a few thoughts this morning on cities in the age of COVID, and particularly on co-living in the region that I work in. Uh, when, when Mike asked me if I'd be interested in taking part in a panel on co-living, and I saw that my fellow panelists would be experts on markets and on co-living as real estate, I thought it would be interesting to consider what it means for our cities. So moving on to the next slide, please, Mike. Let's put this into context. Think of a city center, any city center. It could probably be just about any city in the world. You've got places for carrying out almost every part of your life from sleeping to working, learning and playing. All of them located in close proximity and accessible through a network of public streets that are accessible by all. The thing that I love about cities like these is the potential for serendipity. Taking a walk along a street you don't know, uh, happening across something new, seeing different kinds of people. Now, of course, particularly in Australia, where we'll be hearing about shortly, many people do live in suburban environments, in houses or flats surrounded only by other homes, requiring a car or other form of transport to get into that mixed use center. But investors and consumers, governments and cultural institutions, and urban dwellers all recognize that that traditional city center is the place where things have happened for thousands of years. And urbanization has been accelerating, particularly in my part of the world where not just in China and India, but also all across Southeast Asia, we're seeing rural dwellers move to the cities. And many of those cities are now impacted by COVID. So I see Mike's move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, now, so along comes COVID-19. And in my field, we've all been asking for months, what does it mean for these cities? There's a perception in North America in particular, the density that cities enable the spread of COVID. And that the answer is to move to the suburbs. The data doesn't actually bear that out, however, and tightly built places like Hong Kong, where I live, are proof that density isn't the issue. Um, the issue is overcrowding often, yes, such as you see in the migrant worker dormitories in Singapore, which has been much publicized, but density in and of itself isn't actually the issue. Nonetheless, we are already seeing the corporate real estate departments of global firms looking to make efficiencies by trimming office floor plates and moving offices from expensive CBDs to secondary cities, secondary centers or cities, I should say. That in turn will have effects on how people move and on how investors see development opportunities. Anecdotally, here in Hong Kong, lots of people were excited about working from home. Once they encountered the reality of it though, they became even more excited about returning to the office. So we'll see how this all plays out. But meanwhile, uh, another element is that in North America and in Europe, we're seeing cities use this, city governments use this as an opportunity to take back streets from cars, to change how they deal with open public space and, and work for more sustainable outcomes. In Asia, I think we're actually seeing two narratives and I'm leaving out Australia because I'm sure we'll hear about it from our other panelists later. One, there are places which so far have been very successful in combating COVID in China, where in many places mask wearing isn't even necessary anymore. And in Hong Kong and in Vietnam, for example, there's really no discussion about how our cities are changing, which I think is really interesting. That's, that's the first. The second is places that I love like Manila and Jakarta, um, where there's not much discussion either. Although I would note that Manila has made some interesting changes. They've, for example, they've relocated bus stops on uh, the notoriously jammed up Edsa Highway. But generally in those places, they're just trying to get through the outbreak. There's no opportunity yet, at least, to really think about what this means for the city. And those are the cities which are most vulnerable. So is there something that can be done in these places to help them out is the question. We could, we'll go to the next slide, please, Mike. Just click forward. In other words, would places which are vulnerable benefit from many communities that are a new form of micro safe space? Could these self-contained communities provide a number of the attributes that people look for in cities while keeping them safe from the chaos around them? That's the question that I would pose. And if you just click again, Mike, 
this is the element that's relevant to COVID, which I see co-living potentially offering for a particular demographic, probably younger, single, maybe adventurous people, combining home with the things that they need to relax, work, meet other like-minded people, and to pursue a lifestyle which resonates with them. It's not a panacea. It substitutes safety for serendipity. And we could reflect usefully probably on the effect on the city as a whole. It seems there's an opportunity now, and, and I think we need to ask, once COVID fades from view, what will people want? I think there are a few ways to think about it. What will our cities offer? And to what extent will fear and the perception of risk guide people's lives, driving them into environments like co-living where they can actually feel safe? Is co-living the happy answer to an increasingly atomized society in cities where a sense of community does not exist and where younger people in particular are affected by high housing prices and a sense of disconnection from others? So also is co-living additional or is it competition to other businesses and cities? Is it just for people who need a way to live affordably or is it actually, does it have the potential to become a long-term lifestyle choice? And what does it need to be successful? So that said, uh, I suggest we delve into this further. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Regina, who will give some real data about markets that have shown traction in the co-living space. And I'm very curious to see if there's a link between what I've just shared and her evidence, um, and later on to hear from Jason Clinton and Mark about Australia with their reflections on the potential for and the implications of co-living there. So thank you, and Regina, over to you. Um, so I head up the Asia Pacific Capital Markets Research Team in Jones Lang in JLL, and uh, I think this year is a very different year. Uh, if you look in the past five years, transaction volumes have been going up, interest rates have been very low, and there's a lot of uh, passive pension, insurance, sovereign wealth seeking diversification away from equities and bonds and buying into real estate with stable income streams. But because of COVID, uh, in the first half of this year, transaction volumes in Asia Pacific has fallen 32%. Um, in the markets where there's a lot more domestic activity, domestic capital, um, like Korea, like Japan, like Taiwan, volumes have been more resilient. But outside of these markets, especially where uh, there's a lot more cross-border transactions in the more open international markets, like Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, volumes have fallen much sharper. Uh, if you look at the next slide, you can see that the main reason for this caution is actually the difficulty uh, in assessing and underwriting assets. It's not because there's not enough buyers or enough sellers. It's not because there's not enough money in the system. It's not because funding costs are high. It's simply because, could I have the next slide, please? That, uh, people are having a lot of difficulty underwriting assumptions about future rents. So if you're trying to think about how much to pay for an office building, it's about you know, how frequently will the office building be used, how many employees will be on each floor, and therefore what rent can you charge, and what price can you value the building at. So the same problem is um, happening for office, for retail, for hotel. But for assets where the income stream is extremely predictable, even in this climate, like logistics assets, like living assets, multifamily, co-living, data centers, actually transaction volumes have been really resilient. So logistics uh, transactions in the first half of this year is very similar to first half last year. And I think the interesting thing about multifamily or living assets is that in the first half of this year, uh, transaction volumes in multifamily is equivalent to transactions in the whole of last year. So basically they've doubled in the first half. So if we go to the next slide, I think the question I asked myself at this time is, do we believe this change is cyclical or structural? And I think to me, uh, it's a structural change. It's not cyclical. People are getting a little bit more risk adverse. That's true. But I think over the next five to 10 years, living assets will become a core part of Asia Pacific real estate portfolios for a few reasons. 
One is that I think this pandemic has woken up a lot of portfolio managers' uh, awareness to a very urgent and important need for diversification. So they need to look for assets which are inherently different in terms of uh, cyclical or income or economic upside from what they're traditionally holding, which is office, retail, and hotels. The second reason is also um, when you look at the, the rent collection, when you look at the needs-based nature of living assets, uh, they are very defensive in nature. And in this very low growth climate, potentially people really shouldn't be uh, worried too much about the rental growth upside, but more getting a resilient defensive income stream. And I think the third thing uh, we need to be aware of is that uh, interest rates are getting very, very low. So for the first time in a long time, uh, residential yields are above the cost of funding, which is very rare in Asia. So if it persists, I think a lot of developers who build residential units will find that it doesn't make any sense to sell these uh, units uh, because they yield a rental of 2% and you are able to fund it below that. So then instead of getting the cash, you will just hold on to these assets and you will hold on to them like you would with your commercial assets like office or retail. And uh, all these benefits, I think, will make sure that over the next five to 10 years, multifamily will be just as core to our portfolios as logistics, office, and retail. Next slide. So which part of Asia Pacific do we believe that living assets will do well? For one thing, 90% uh, of the transactions we've seen in Asia Pacific today uh, has occurred in Japan. It's a very established class. There's a huge amount of stock, a huge proportion of the population is renting and uh, you're getting a nice yield above the cost of debt. So if you look at the other major multifamily asset classes around the world, uh, the Japanese yields are still 40 bits above office yields and you don't see that anywhere else in the world. So I'm optimistic that we will see yield compression in the Japanese multifamily asset class not just in Tokyo and Osaka, in the core districts, but also in the fringe areas of these large cities and also in newer cities like Fukuoka and Sapporo. The reason is because maybe for the very first time in history, Japanese employees have the flexibility to work outside of the office. So culturally, they haven't been able to do that, but maybe from here on, they will have this flexibility. That will increase the demand for residential units away from core city centers of Tokyo and Osaka. And if demand goes up, actually you get a two-way uh, win. Basically, your rents could go up and then you could also get a uh, more impressive yield compression because today those yields are higher than central Tokyo and central Osaka. The second market I'm very excited about for multifamily in Asia Pacific is actually Australia. So there's an increase in the number of renters versus owners in Australia. So there is a demand pool over there. And so far, it hasn't really triggered developers to hold on to units and rent them out, uh, maybe because of some structural barriers. But the government has decided this year, at least in New South Wales, to sort of equalize the tax laws to encourage more uh, living uh, assets, more multifamily, more built to rent. So I think uh, that could happen to other state governments and potentially at the federal level, if we can make some changes to the MIT structures and the tax efficiency, I think international investors will be very interested in Australia as a second market in addition to Japan. And I think thirdly, we should really take a look at South Korea. They don't have uh, a huge uh, living sector there, but the number of renters in Seoul is higher than the number of renters in Japan. So why does Japan have such a huge multi-family sector? And in Seoul, all the renting is done from units individually owned by mums and pubs, uncles and aunties. I think it's because of the huge desire to rent, uh, to, to own units as a form of, you know, leveraging on the growth of the city. As If the city grows, then my residential unit will appreciate in rents and prices. And that was a great form of uh, getting wealthier, is a form of savings for the individual retirees. But 
in this low growth, low interest rate environment, I think people will start to rethink that. And we've seen international institutional investors such as GIC going into so um, buying into development projects, whole funding local developers, and the, with the intention to hold those residential units for rental in the longer term rather than to sell them piecemeal. So I think that's encouraging and I think more investors will look at the market and may follow in those footsteps. Last but not least, China cannot be ignored in Asia Pacific. Now, in China, there's a huge desire to own because 80% of women will not marry a man if he doesn't already own an apartment. It's part of a cultural thing, you know, if I birth your child, you better house me as well because unless you want to do the birthing, you better buy the housing. Uh, I think it's totally, you know, reasonable. It's a very, very small ask. But so the culture of renting hasn't been entrenched and these kind of social changes will take decades. But what's encouraging is that from 2017, the government has tried to address the lack of affordability, the rising home prices by rezoning sites purely for rental housing. So developers who buy those sites cannot sell units uh, for investments. They have to hold the residential for rental. And these sites are getting built and we're getting about 300,000 units in Shanghai and Beijing over the next three years purely rental housing. What this would do is it quite create a sea change in the mindset of young people that renting isn't a bad solution. If you can't afford it, you can rent it, you can get married anyways. So I'm hopeful that in China, as that social change happens, we'll get a very functional, very liquid, very scalable market, maybe bigger than Japan, maybe even bigger than the US because the stock is, is such, is, is that size. So lastly, I want to say that actually the last thing that I haven't mentioned, but a lot of speakers will touch on, is on the demand pool, where a lot of young people nowadays see this world as their oyster and they're happy to work in a different city every second or third year. And uh, they will see owning, uh, not as an asset, but maybe as a liability, uh, because it, it is a huge amount of commitment. We've made prices so high, we are stealing from the young. And also, you know, it's, it's not something you would want to do if you are thinking about moving to another city in the next two, three years. So that pool of renters will be there. And we just need people not to sell their units away after they build them. Hold on to them and sell them to institutional investors because there's way too, too, way too much money in this world. I just want to show you my iPhone. I took this photograph on the 1st of September. I tried to buy some fixed deposits from DBS and uh, every single rate bar three were negative. So I just wanna like stick that point there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Regina. Uh, some really great insights there from a you know broader perspective. Um, again, I think what we'll do is we'll continue the presentations as we move now into Australia, which we touched upon as a a potential increasing um, opportunity destination for investors to think about with this subsector within real estate. So in, in that, I would like to hand over the floor to, um, to Jason. And uh, Jason is uh, based in Australia, but also pre-COVID uh, used to also uh, come to Southeast Asia quite a bit as well. So he's got knowledge of the Vietnam market a little bit as well. I'm not sure if he wants to talk about Vietnam at all uh, in his opening remarks, but over to you, Jason. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Regina. Um, firstly, I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Jason Eggleton, tell you a little bit about myself, and then I'll go into more about the co-living sector. I started in the property sector about 30 years ago. I started and delivered my first development with my uh, long-standing friend and business partner, Aaron Hatch. We have a boutique development company called Ajani. Ajani specialises in specialised in high-end residential apartments, townhouses and homes. Our product normally sells between two and eight million dollars Australian. The thing we learned from starting the developments was the skill set of how to acquire property. Most of the property we acquire is off market and it's directly with the owners. Sometimes we go through agents. And through these 30 years, what we've learned is the skill set of getting approvals. The hardest thing in New South Wales 
is to gain approval on a property. The legislation, the councils, the state, uh, it's a bit of a minefield if you don't really uh, have the right team behind you and the expertise. When we started to look at different asset classes, when I started to look into co-living, uh, we secured a site in 2014 as our litmus test. It was a small site on the northern beaches and we gained approval for 17 micro apartments or studios. We subsequently sold the asset and it's now being run uh, by an international co-living operator. From that, I then started collaboration with Highgate Management to expand the co-living sector into Australia, we need to have scalability. Highgate is a development management, project management company that has uh, been instrumental in PBSA student accommodation. Uh, we've delivered 700 rooms for UTS, University of Technology in Sydney. We've also done some, uh, years ago, we started in the uh, backpack segment for YHA Australia. So we've been in the co-living dormitory style segment for a long time. Uh, you might go to the next slide, please, Michael. Okay. In Australia, uh, predominantly, most of the micro apartment studios are developed under a, a state legislation in New South Wales called the Affordable Housing Set, and it's designed for boarding houses. Most of the purpose-built student accommodation is done under this legislation. Uh, what we've decided when we looked at the different models globally, we looked at asset light models that are similar to what Hamlet in uh, Singapore is running. We looked at common in the US and, and, and uh, quarters in Germany. We also looked at the hybrid models like we have in Australia with UKO, which is an asset light, asset heavy model. And we looked at the collective in the UK as an asset heavy model. When we looked at different funding, equity funding partners and investors, we saw a lot of VCs like the asset light model because they could go on a time zone, a bit like the WeWork model. We decided to steer away from that and went more towards the vertically integrated asset heavy model. We think that for Australia, it's a better model for this, for this asset class. We then looked at flat sharing models that Hamlet does where they might get a, a number of apartments and rent the rooms out individually. We looked at dormitory style models that are, are prevalent in Singapore with life and in Hong Kong and Singapore with, Ham, with Weave Living. We decided that the psyche of the Australian populace and New Zealand couldn't really get itself around to living long term in a dormitory style accommodation. And we've decided to go towards micro apartments. What we learned from our first development in 2014, that the communal spaces we delivered in our micro apartments weren't large enough. We were doing about half a metre per occupant. We've now expanded that to two to three metres, depending on the size of the development. What we're finding about our uh, residents and the age group of our majority of our residents is they're millennials and coming forward is their Generation Z. Now, the wonderful thing about this group of uh, individuals and a collective group is they're prop tech savvy. For us to give a competitive property or home for them to live, it's really about the apps we supply. So in our prop tech, in our, in our apps that we're developing, it gives them the ability to be, to be connected as a community within their other residents. We also have flat sharing, car sharing, and butler services attached to the app. They have a, if they're relocating, we try to keep them under a membership program so that the app connects them to our next property. And the thing we found from our research is people need to personalise the space. Even though our spaces we create are movable spaces where the furniture moves around the apartment and creates different nuances within the apartment, like a place to work, a place to hang out, a place to read a book, a place to watch a movie, a place to gather with friends. We also realised that our guests need to personalise the space. So we give them the opportunity to put up objects to make it feel like home. When you are living in a 23 to 25 square metre apartment, the communal spaces are your other rooms. They're your lounge room, they're your media room, they're your garden, 
So this is why we've increased the size of our communal areas from half a metre per occupant to two to three metres. We've also realised that this gives our tenants the desire to stay longer. From instead of being a three to six month lease, we see that they're really pushing out to a year and longer. And the good thing for us as an asset class is this gives us more security of tenure. You know, we're looking at vacancy rates of 1%. And in Sydney, we're looking at vacancy rates statistically at about 3%. They have gone up in COVID to sit around about 4%. But we see in the future post COVID that we think that that will definitely go back to 2 to 3%. If we get to the next slide, please, Michael. Our core, our core guests at the moment are millennials. There's 1.5 million millennials in Australia at the moment, of which 250 of those millennials aged 25 to 34 live by themselves on their own. 20% of the millennials earn over the national average. Going forward, by the time we have uh, created our platform and delivering the majority of our homes, our, our micro apartments, our biggest number of guests will be in the Generation Z. ABS statistics show that there'll be 500,000 more 25 to 34 year olds by 2030. And between nine, 2019 to 2026, it'll get to about 400,000. Generation Z, we see as the first generation that's really grown up tech savvy. I know I have three, and before they could walk, before they could speak, they could use a mouse and, you know, navigate the internet, you know. I think their first words were, you know, A, B, C, and the wiggles on, you know, their mouse and singing songs. If you're not tech savvy, and if you don't have a shared community, if you can't give them a connection virtually and a connection physically, you're not responding to the target market. We see prop tech as one of the uh, biggest connectors for the community. It, cur it curates events. It keeps them connected into promotions, collaborations. It has a butler service. It can organise who's renting or who's utilising certain space in the communal areas like the guest kitchen, the meeting rooms, the work rooms. We organise events through the app for doing garden sessions. If you want to go in the garden and do some gardening, look after the herb garden, the vegetables. It's the app that keeps the community connected. We can go to the next slide, please, Michael. So what we're creating and what we see the vision of co-living is really vertical villages. We see that these vertical villages give the generation millennials and Z the connectivity. We see that through the buildings and through the communal spaces, they can live in their own protective residency, in their own dwelling, but they also have that connected empowerment within the community. We see that there's sometimes a lot of collaboration between our residences when they're working in a working environment. We see also that when we do curated events with particular speakers, that can also spark this, this collaborative uh, connectivity between the residences. They also seem to grow friendships and become part of their social network. You can go to the next slide, please, Michael. So where we position co-living is really, we see it as the largest growing, fastest growing asset class globally in the residential built around sector. We see it as really effective impact investing. It's low risk, it has vacancy rates of one to 3%. We see traditionally that the growth is higher than CPI and better than wages when we look at rent growth over the last 25 years. With us, with our impact investing, we're creating buildings that are sustainable. We put solar power, we create batteries to harness that energy. All our buildings that we are developing are water management systems to minimise water loss. We do composting on site for the gardens. We, have, we grow herbs and vegetables in the gardens that the community utilises. We get the, unit, the community together to collaborate, foster friendships, to create events, to work within our local communities. And we see a lot of the local community wanting to be part of the co-living 
co-living building as well because they have a, a captive market to talk about what their product is. One of the biggest issues we see and one of the biggest benefits in uh, New South Wales and Australia is mental health around the younger generation is a real problem. They feel the loneliness. What we find with the co-living and the connective community it really helps that sense of not being lonely. For us, Highgate and what we're doing, um, we've already started our pipeline. We're securing sites off market, we're gaining approvals. What we do is we increase the value because of the development potential. Uh, we're delivering them, we're building our buildings that are designed for low maintenance, longevity. We integrate development, deliver the asset, we have a management facility, a property management sector, facilities management. Our investors receive a quarterly coupon once the asset is stabilised. And our projected returns to the investors are around about 15% per annum based on our exit strategy of 2026. We started our pipeline, we're aiming for 3,000 micro apartment studios operational by 2026. And thus we're trying to create, you know, one of the first billion dollar assets in the co-living sector. We see the sector as having huge growth, not only in Australia, New Zealand, and the Asia Pacific region, but globally. There are some really strong uh, initiatives and a lot of, as Regina was saying, money looking to get into the sector. We see that the, the tight yields, we look back at PBSA, they started at 8%, they're now, now selling at sub 5% yields. And we really see that this class uh, is quite attractive and safe to the investor. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to Clinton and look forward to hearing Clinton and Mark's uh, presentations. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you, uh, Jason and, and Clinton. Um, could you introduce yourself uh, briefly and then uh, go into your slides? Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Well, hi, everyone. Um, um, great um, presentation so far. I think it gives some uh, terrific insight into the sector across, I suppose, Asia Pacific and in Australia. But uh, what I'll be focusing on is looking at a little bit more of the supply and demand dynamics um, that really will affect the co-living and builder rent sectors uh, in Australia. So uh, my role at Urbis, um, we're a major um, property advisory town planning and urban design firm uh, operating right across Australia um, and also into uh, Asia and the Middle East um, through our brand Sistry, uh, which is based in Singapore. Um, my role is the Group Director of Property Economics and Research, so um, our area really is focusing on um, the research into this space, looking at what consumers um, and renters are looking for and uh, how developers will actually meet the demand going forward. Um, so I'll jump straight into it, just give them time. So if you want to click through for me, Michael. So um, what we're seeing is some real shifts that are occurring both pre and, and post COVID. Um, and um, it, it's important to actually understand some in the lead up to, to COVID because there's obviously a lot of focus on the impact of COVID, um, what had been happening in the market and, um, and what that means. So if you just click through the next slide, Michael. So just um, what we're uh, looking at here is um, uh, the number of uh, renters. So on the right hand side, um, you can see a table there that talks about um, the number of people who are renting by age group. Looking at 2006, so a census period in 2016, um, our last census period, so a 10 year period. And what we can see there is a significant change in the um, number or the proportion of people renting by age group. Um, really the biggest shift uh, overall is in that 20 to 34 year age group where 43% of people were renting back in 2006 and that's now grown to 48%. But across the board, right on across um, all age groups sort of up to 64, um, we've seen a, a growth in the number of proportion of people renting. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, if you, if you look at what's happened over the last 25 years, the proportion of people renting in the market has actually grown by about 50% overall. So from just under 20% um, of the market to now focusing of uh, just under 30% of all households. So there has been a real shift. Australia has been a market which has been dominated by uh, own occupation. Um, and certainly 25 years ago, we had a high proportion of people who actually owned their dwellings outright. Um, that's uh, continued to fall and the number of people who own the mortgages has increased. And that's uh, uh, put a lot of in, uh, impact on um, housing affordability issues, on the ownership um, 
perspective. And so renting has become certainly more prolific and, and prominent. If we look out to 2026, even if we don't um, make any changes to the proportion of people renting, uh, there is a significant growth in the number of people who are renting. So um, it's a, works out to be about an extra one and a half million people renting in the Australian market between 2016 and 2026, even if that proportion of people renting stays static. So there is a huge growth in the market. And if anything, with the, the move and the, the dynamics that we're seeing um, in terms of particularly those um, millennials, the Gen Y and um, the Gen Z coming through, um, is that there is a, a high proportion of those people who are looking to rent. One, because they're looking for experiences um, and they're looking for high amenity. And often um, that amenity is, is, is focused in on where the major activity centres are and therefore where a high proportion of renters are as well, or rental apartments are. So we just want to click through, we'll um, just have a bit of a discussion about, um, I suppose, some of the shake-up that has happened as a result of COVID-19 and, and really sort of think about some of the um, mitigating factors which had already been um, at play pre prior to COVID-19. So if we just want to go through the next slide. Um, what we're seeing here at the moment is the fact that uh, Australia has been highly dependent on um, overseas, net overseas migration, or actually fuel population growth. So about 60% of total population growth had been coming through um, overseas migration. Um, a good proportion of that is driven by students. Australia is um, um, the second biggest destination in the world for uh, Asian students to actually come and study here. Um, and that has a significant impact, but, and, and why we've seen uh, markets like the student combination sector grow so significantly. Um, from uh, about 75,000 student accommodation beds uh, about 10 years ago um, to where we're sitting now at about um, 113,000 uh, beds in 2020. So um, growing significantly over that time, about 7% per annum uh, total growth. Um, but the majority of, of growth actually is in permanent um, migrants coming to Australia. But the impact of COVID-19 has been significant in that we're effectively seeing a stop um, to people coming into the country. And so that's going to have a fairly significant impact in the number of people who actually moved into Australia during the period of June 2020, but looking forward to the current um, financial year out to the end of June uh, 2021, a significant drop off. And so that will have a material impact in the short term in terms of demand for, for residential. And so it's something that we do have to um, contemplate and um, think about in terms of the uh, the impacts on the market going forward. If we just want to click through to the next slide. So a lot of that um, uh, focus in terms of where migrants uh, go will actually be within sort of central areas, particularly Melbourne and Sydney. And so uh, for those who can't actually see, there's a, a, a couple of maps here which just show the, the proportion of um, people actually coming in and moving in and, and where the high proportions of overseas migrants um, are actually landing and living. And so there will be some impacts there. If we just slip through to the next slide, um, so if we think about the, the recovery and, and the sort of things that we need to think about is that um, it, the areas that are most impacted, um, more than 50% of the, of the population growth is actually um, uh, going into about 277 of our uh, SA2s, which typically represent a suburb in Australia. Um, and often those areas are getting on average, about, uh, overseas migration is counting for about 109% of population growth. So what that means is that it's counting for all the population growth, but also replacing um, existing population, which is moving out to other areas. So um, they're actually replacing people who are leaving, but also then topping up and, and making the majority. So overseas migration is particularly important in those areas. Um, so the apartment market certainly is going to be hit um, with 80% of the supply in these areas. Um, that are really dependent on overseas migrants um, um, uh, making up apartments. And so that's going to be significant. And so, um, and they also, those areas also, they're going to be most impacted, have also made up about 40,000 dwelling approvals per annum. So there is a particularly um, harsh impact on the apartment market. But if we think about what has been happening going forward, if we flip through the next um, slide, we have started, so prior to COVID-19 hitting us, we had seen a, a reduction in sales by volume in terms of uh, sales in apartments off the plan in pre-sales, but also those that are under construction. So there had been a fall in sales volume over that time. Uh, but we had started to see an increase in the number of sales occurring in finished product, which is indicating the fact that we had seen a, a slowdown in the number of investors in particular buying off the plan, um, meaning that we had a, an increase in people buying completed product. 
And so that, that slowdown in, in pre-sales had already started to occur. And what that had led to was the fact that new apartment launches, so the number that are actually launched for sale in each of the cities had fallen dramatically, particularly in markets like Sydney and Melbourne, we can see there are a substantial drop in the number of new apartments being launched. So what we were starting to see prior to COVID was actually a set of circumstances which were leading to a potential undersupply um, in the number of apartments being delivered to actually meet population growth that was uh, occurring in Australia through a combination of natural increase in overseas migration. Um, what COVID has done is basically um, uh, let a relief valve off. So um, we're not going to see the same level of undersupply that we're going to see, but we're also, the market had already um, um, put itself in a position where uh, the, the level of new supply coming out of the ground was going to reduce anyway. So if anything, that's going to buffer the market to a degree. So whilst these impacts are there, there are some other conditions on the other side which are going to um, help buffer the market. But that does um, create a bit of a gap uh, when it comes to thinking about how um, new demand, uh, particularly in that um, Generation Z group that are coming through who are existing population already in Australia um, that are moving out into the market uh, will be accommodated. So if we just slip through to the next slide, um, we're seeing that, that sort of continued reduction in the number of new apartments at the top in terms of total apartments being built. But if we look at the bottom uh, chart there, we can see that the um, the rolling quarterly pipeline of new build to rent units in Australia has been increasing, but um, ultimately we've only had about um, 2,200 build to rent units, and that build to rent also includes co living um, units uh, between 2018 and 2020. So, this compared to other markets is still a fledgling market and um, only makes up a very small proportion of what has been lost in terms of that supply, which would otherwise have been delivered. Um, in, the, in the planning or approved stage, there's about four, five and a half thousand. Um, apartments in that stage. So still representing a very small comp component of the market if you compare it to a market like PBSA has a long way to go and a, and a, and a huge growth uh, opportunity that's there. Um, we do do research directly with um, consumers and we have talked to those who are living, people who are already living in co-living and built terrain apartments and generally their experiences um, are marked as being much higher than in the traditional apartment market uh, based on the level of service that they receive, um, the um, the maintenance levels that are much higher um, and the overall experience in terms of um, support from the owners and the building management being much higher has led to a, an overall um, high level of um, service and, and um, also um, satisfaction. So what we're seeing, particularly in markets like the Gen Y and Gen Z markets, where experience is a much more important factor for them in the way that they make decisions that um, these sorts of services will actually resonate with them. We just want to um, flip through to the next uh, and final slide that I'll be presenting. Um, we have actually done some work to look at um, the, I suppose we're calling it the rental demand diamond and in understanding um, the segments of the market that they can actually, that are renting and can afford um, to spend more on rent uh, versus those which are impacted. And what we found is that nearly 60% of people in the rental market can actually afford to pay more than they're currently paying in rent. And so that provides an opportunity for those um, build to rent markets, whether it's rent to own, shared equity, co-living, uh, build to rent or affordable build to rent. Um, um, and in that, in that sense, uh, we can see there that there are sort of luxury rentals at the very top, which is about 2.6% of the market can afford to spend about 20 to 30% more than they're currently spending on rentals. 31% uh, can spend um, 10 to 20% more than they're currently spending in about another um, 20, uh, 28% can spend about this from uh, zero to 10% more than they're currently spending. Whereas that, um, and that basically means that they can um, spend more, but still um, be, meet the definition of not being within um, uh, housing stress, meaning that their rental is still less than 30% of their disposable income. Um, and so there is a, a very a significant core market there that the, the built rent market can um, actually tap into. Uh, interestingly, with a co-living perspective, doing slightly smaller apartments, we have done some research for the New South Wales government looking at how smaller apartments, um, compact housing can actually contribute to affordability. And so the study we, show, we undertook showed that um, across Sydney, um, the, the smaller um, co-living co and uh, compact apartments can actually reduce rental costs by between 10 and 20% and maintain a high level of viability for the developer. 
Um, and that's not necessarily to say that they are affordable housing, affordable housing in the classic definition of affordable housing in Australia, which is um, housing which is less than 30% of, of income. But uh, what it says is that it can provide more affordable housing and certainly increase the, the level of option and the service that um, the market is looking for. So, um, so overall, whilst there's some uh, difficult news that we have to contemplate with COVID and the impacts there, there are also those other mitigating factors which mean that as we start to recover, and Australia is very well placed to actually rebuild its um, overseas net migration um, intake given the, the way that we've been able to deal with the pandemic to date and the, the fact that we've been able to control impacts uh, very well compared to other places in the world. Uh, our reputation is quite strong and I think that um, once we can see a return to migration we'll, uh, we'll benefit from that and see a, a significant increase in that market opportunity. So I'll finish there and uh, I'll hand over to Mark. Thanks, uh, Clinton. Very quickly, um, we have had a question from Renee. Uh, how has COVID affected co-living in Australia? And I think pretty much what you just covered, Clinton, has kind of uh, answered that question. So I won't uh, dwell on it too much. And I'll let Mark, uh, last but not least, to... One thing, one thing I will say, though, okay. just to give a, 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 an example, that uh, sure. you know, the concerns around co-living and whether um, COVID is actually a, a, a negative. If we look at the student accommodation market, there hasn't been one... Uh, COVID cluster in any student accommodation facility in Australia today. Um, and it shows that, um, this, you know, which is a, a classic example of, of you know, a co-living type environment. And it goes to show that the level of management that's actually put in place and the fact that people can um, you know, quarantine with a larger group does provide a lot of benefits. Um, and, um, you know, so it's not necessarily a negative, I think as Elo was saying um, in, in his opening address, it's, uh, it's actually proven to be a relatively safe um, way of living. Okay, great. And uh, just as I hand over to Mark, uh, the chair, um, the audience out there, if you've got any questions in mind, you can start thinking about them and typing them in the Q&A as, as you hear Mark's presentation, and then we'll try to come to some of those after he's finished. Thank you. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, Michael. Um, so my name is Mark Power. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm leading the charge on, on Build for Rent and co-living at Qualitas. Uh, for those of you that, uh, that don't know the Qualitas name, we're, we're essentially uh, Australia's leading alternate uh, real estate funds manager and financier. Uh, we deploy across the whole capital spectrum um, and we're, uh, we're very strong advocates of, uh, of build to rent and, and co-living in, in Australia. So next slide, thanks Michael. Um, as I was saying, we're, we're very, very strong advocates of the, uh, the, the actual sector. Uh, largely for the reasons that uh, earlier presenters ha have actually raised. Uh, and we see co-living as being an integral part of, of, of that sector. Um, it provides, for, for us, it provides affordable, high quality rental accommodation in, in desirable locations that are going to appeal to the millennials and Generation Z. Um, very important for, for co-living. We don't, we, the co-living developments have to be in, in areas that that resonate very, very strongly with, with that particular with that particular rental rental cohort. Um, it's fair to say that build to rent and co-living has, has has lagged other more mature markets around the globe. If we look at the US, uh, the UK, uh, Japan, where they're they're very much established asset classes. Um, here in Australia, it's it's very much more so emerging. Um, but we believe that's largely where the opportunity lies as well for those entrants that, that get into the sector early days, um, the returns are potentially potentially much, much greater. Uh, we, we track the, uh, the pipeline of projects very closely, um, particularly in the, uh, in the build for rent sector and, and our tracking at the moment um, has a pipeline of circa 10,500 apartments um, over, over 33 projects. Um, they're primarily up the eastern seaboard of Australia, primarily Melbourne, Sydney, with a greater concentration in Melbourne. And the reason we're seeing that greater concentration in Melbourne is simply because land is, 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 is cheaper in, in, in that market so that the numbers actually work better than, than Sydney. Having said that, we think this is where co-living uh, has got a real space for itself, particularly in, in Sydney and, and, and inner, inner Sydney where the land values are traditionally um, much higher than, than that of Melbourne. So because of the additional density that you can actually get into a co-living development, um, the, 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 
the numbers within a project are much more feasible than they, what they would be in a traditional build to rent project. And certainly that's what we're seeing when we're talking to uh, developers who are looking to develop out in this space. There's a real concentration on that uh, on that inner Sydney market. Uh, we're also having some conversations with parties in in the Melbourne market as well, and I think it, it will um, it will continue to to gain pace and and, and gain momentum um, within uh, within in that particular market. Um, I think it was it was quite interesting. Uh, Savills recently did a uh, a study where they looked at the essentially the top 100 locations within Australia for, for co-living and, and where that, that those locations land. And, and essentially the finding was 88 of the top 100 were in, uh, were in the gateway cities of, of Sydney or Melbourne. So it just highlights the, um, the, the, the way in which we believe this asset class will resonate um, with the, the rental cohorts of those um, uh, millennials and, and, and Generation Zs who are actually looking for lifestyle um, and and an affordable lifestyle which uh, which co-living can can provide in space uh, next slide please uh, pleasingly the um, the governments around Australia are, are starting to get on board and, and recognize that the the built rent and co-living sector um, has has the ability to provide additional supply in, into the Australian housing market and also um, with that additional supply, greater affordability and, and, and greater choice. Um, and I think it's, it's never been more important than it is now. Um, and, and for the reasons that, that, that Clinton showed on the, on the screen only recently, is that whilst demand has actually um, pulled back because of the, the immigration tap turning off in Australia um, post COVID, uh, the, the supply pipeline of, uh, of apartments um, being delivered into the Australian market is turning off very, very quickly indeed. And in fact, it was already tapering off prior to, um, prior to COVID coming into place. It's just exacerbated the situation. So we actually need within, within this country, um, the, the, the build to rent sector and the co-living sector um, to actually gain pace and momentum to fill the demand, not just the demand that's, that's currently there, but then again, the demand which will be amplified again once the immigration tap is, is turned back on and we return back to, to what will be a new normal. So the governments have, have, have recognised that. Um, it was really pleasing to see the New South Wales government come out recently um, and provide a 50% land tax concession um, in the, uh, the build to rent sector. Um, the the modelling that we've done that that on a traditional build to rent project that can be 30 to 40 basis points accretive to to, um, to 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 passing returns, which we think is is definitely a positive. Um, the New South Wales government's also recently announced uh, recently released a, a draft uh, housing diversity planning policy, uh, which actually looks to include co living as a, an emerging typology within the state planning system. So what that actually means is that um, co-living becomes a permitted use within within certain designated zones, which is um, which is very pleasing for, for the sector and uh, and it's giving it the recognition that it that it needs and, and that it deserves. Um, the, um, the, the the policy the draft policy also goes into to further detail around specifying um, what. Uh, a co-living development should actually look like, and and they specify minimum apartment sizes of, of 30 to 35 square metres, car park ratios of 0.5, um, and minimum levels of, uh, of communal and, and 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 private open space. Now, those numbers are still being um, being discussed and and debated by industry, and will continue to be. It's very much a draft form, and I think we'll find that. Um, that there's a bit of a shifting in, in some of those parameters prior to the, the policy actually being, being finalised. Um, we're also, also aware that the Victorian state government um, has been putting significant time and energy into to ways in which they can activate this sector as well. In some ways, I think New South Wales has come out and, and trumped the Victorian government and, uh, and got slightly ahead of the curve and, and, and kind of surprised everyone, to be honest. We thought the Victorian government might have been the, um, the, the first out of the box. Um, but we'd, uh, we, we believe that um, the Victorian government will come out um, with, with supportive policy announcements in the, in the very short term as well to ensure that the sector continues to be, be well supported within the, um, the, the Melbourne and Victorian marketplace as well. Next slide, next, uh, next slide please, Michael. Uh, 
that brings me to uh, to uh, a part of the uh, the discussion which is very dear to my heart, which is uh, which is capital, um, and essentially the the returns work. Um, if you're looking at built for rent developments, um, and we've been looking at a significant number in in recent times, uh, we're seeing unlevered equity IRRs in the in the range of seven to nine percent, and then if you put leverage in into the equation, you're up to sort of ten to to fourteen percent per annum uh, type range. Um, and co-living uh, provides higher returns again, simply because of the density that you can incorporate into into these developments. So you know, we're we're seeing unlevered IRRs in the co-living space of, of eight to elevens, and then and then that pushes up into the, the mid teens um, once some, some leverage is, uh, is is put into the capital stack. So so for mine in that in what's essentially a low return low return environment on a global basis. Um, to be able to get these sort of returns in in what is arguably the most defensive asset class in Australia, um, I think becomes a very compelling investment equation, um, particularly given it's it's, it's emerging in in Australia. Um, it's a market that we believe uh, will grow and and grow strongly and establish itself. Um, so for those parties that get into the sector as early adopters, um, we think they'll uh, and establish a, a platform in the same way that you were, you were talking earlier, Jason. Um, we think there will be um, there'll be some material cap rate compression within that asset class um, as uh, as the years go by. So so those those returns are being recognised by um, by global by global uh, equity capital, and we're seeing institutional parties come into the the Australian market. And a lot of those institutional parties are supporting that pipeline that I, that I mentioned earlier. So if we look at the likes of, um, and to name a few, and, and they're names that people are going to know, um, Mervac, um, GIC, uh, Blackstone, Greystar, Sentinel, and uh, pleasingly, uh, very recently, uh, we had uh, one of our largest Australian super funds actually invest um, a significant amount of money in, in a local platform here. So that was Australian super have come in with a, uh, a very large investment into the Assemble platform here in, uh, here in Australia. Um, so we, we, we find significant capital coming in in an institutional, in an institutional sense, and we expect that to, uh, expect that to continue. Uh, we also see um, these same investors um, participating in the, uh, in, in the co-living sector um, as, as the sector con continues to emerge. Um, as far as um, as far as Qualitas is concerned, um, we we're looking to um, deploy equity into the sector. We've got involvement in an equity sense in a, in a multi-family project over in Chelsea in Manhattan at the moment, um, which is in its early days. But we are looking to become a lot more involved in the local market here as well. And we'll, we'll actually be launching our first uh, build for rent. It's more a traditional build for rent project, um, which is uh, which is in Melbourne um, over the course of the the, the next sixty days. So, um, for those on the call, uh, look out for that. Um, I'm sure you'll see it when it's uh, when it's announced. Um, as, uh, we'll, maybe we'll move to the next slide. Thanks, Michael. As far as debt capital is concerned, um, there's certainly debt capital available from traditional lenders in this space where. But where we think that's been a, a big handbrake on the sector is that that, that debt is at, at, at fairly conservative gearing levels. So, and those gearing levels potentially work for some of the institutional capital coming into the market, but not necessarily for the private capital coming through. So, so what we find is that, that um, loan to value rate, that debt's essentially being sized on loan to value ratios in the order of 45 to, to 50%. Which, which means that if, if, if someone who's relatively capital constrained wishes to uh, develop a significant platform here, it becomes very difficult with that sort of leverage. And I mean, for, for, for mine, it's interesting, I've got a, a banking background and I find it quite interesting that, that the banks are at those sort of levels when you consider the, um, uh, the defensive nature of the, the asset class and, and the income stream. Um, if you're going to gear an asset class, if you were going to gear any real estate asset class higher, I would have thought it would be this one. I think what holds them back is the fact that it's still an emerging asset class um, here in Australia and the traditional banks uh, have generally been fairly slow to adopt when, um, when, when new asset classes have come on board. 
So, so to that effect, if, 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 a, if a party's after higher leverage, they would then point to the alternate sector. Um, the alternate sector debt offerings in build to rent and co-living are reasonably thin on the ground. Um, we, we at Quality has actually established a, um, a, a significant debt fund in the space earlier this year, known as the Qualitas Build to Rent Impact Debt Fund. Um, and that's essentially designed to put more leverage in, into these transactions and recognise the defensive nature of the income stream, um, uh, which then uh, essentially boosts IRR and return to the, the investor as well. So that, that fund is sized more so at a loan to value ratio of circa 70% rather than say 45 to 50%. Um, and it's it very importantly, it's, it's, it's also got a very strong sustainability overlay associated with the fund. The, um, the, the fund was, was uh, cornerstone backed by um, the federal government's Clean Energy Finance Corporation. So very pleased to have them on board as a, um, as, as a very significant investor into the fund. And it's essentially Australia's first debt fund to elevate sustainability into its, into its investment criteria. We think of we think of all uh, the all the, the real estate sectors, both build to rent and co living, um, uh, align themselves very well to developing product with sustainability in mind, uh, and we think that's that's important and it works for a number of reasons. Um, uh, firstly, it's it's uh, it. it it's, it makes sense and it's the right thing to do. If, if you're a developer and you're actually building product which you're looking to, to own for a period of years, it makes sense to invest in the, in the fabric of the building. It makes sense from a, uh, from, from in terms of operating outgoings, uh, outgoings moving forward. Um, and, and very importantly, I think it resonates really, really strongly with the rental cohort that build for rent and co-living is looking to attract. Um, and we think that that in part can also assist in, in driving premium rental outcomes on, on these developments moving forward. So in summary, um, from, certainly from, uh, from my personal point of view and, 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 and the house view of Quiet House is that we believe um, there's an enormous amount of latent demand for both built rent and co-living in Australia. Um, we're very, very much in, in the early days and, and in the early days of that, we, we see there's tremendous opportunity. Um, providing we, we get the, the product and the, the, the operator and, 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 uh, and the location of these products, uh, these projects right. Um, we see capital entering the sector um, uh, and we think more and more capital will enter the sector um, simply because on a risk adjusted basis, we believe the, the returns here are, are compelling. Back okay, to you, Mark. Um, thank you so much. I'm just conscious of time because uh, we're getting close to the end of our uh, session already because we had such rich content. Um, and what I like to do, I was just going to, I have uh, a couple of questions coming in, but I just want to launch a poll, but uh, really focus on question two rather than question one because I, I actually forgot to send it out. But if you want to answer question one, please do. So I'm launching that now. Uh, you'll see it on your screens. Feel free to vote in the question one and question two. But in particular, question two, now, now, now that you've listened to all the panellists, you know, what do you feel about the segment uh, as a high degree of low risk return opportunity in Australian market in particular, uh, or also the wider Asian region? So if you agree that Australia is a good investment opportunity to consider, then obviously click yes. Um, and then there's some other options there as well. So some of the questions that were coming in, and maybe uh, I want to bring back uh, Regina in here very quickly, is some people have raised the question about short-term risk on investment in this area because of the, uh, the pressure on, obviously, uh, tourist arrivals, which have been hardest hit in certain countries, in addition to, obviously, students. But I think students less so because they do need to go back to colleges and universities at some point and governments are making it a priority to uh, allow that safely to happen. But from a tourist perspective, do you see lower class hotel owners entering the long stay room rental market and offering uh, deals that could, in the short term, I guess, affect those who have already got supply in the uh, co-living space per se, or I guess more short rentals as well. Do you want to comment on that, Regina, while the polls are being voted on? What would hotel owners do in the short term until tourism resumes? Is that the question? Yeah, pretty much. And does it would it affect, uh, I guess, invent 
investor sentiment at all. I, I don't think so myself, because I think it's more of a medium to long term um, investment choice, especially from a institutional point of view. But it was just a question that's come in is about the risk factors of uh, it, until travel bubbles in some way allow for tourism to return. Is there any risks there in this uh, lower end of the, the supply chain of, uh, of accommodation? Yes, there is risk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you expect me to say. I think institutional investors uh, have a fiduciary duty to you know, ensure that there's capital protection and there's risk adjusted returns for the pensioners, retirement funds that they're looking after. So buying a hotel six months after COVID breaks is not the best idea, even if it's your own money. Um, different hotels in different locations are doing different things. In jurisdictions where domestic travel is a bigger portion, they are weathering it better. I mean, China local hotels are at high occupancies. Uh, we've got one week holiday coming up in China and people are traveling within China as if you know nothing is wrong. They're having big thousand people pool parties in Wuhan because Wuhan has no more COVID. Um, it's, um, in Singapore, we are screwed, right? Because uh, we are like a tiny island uh, with, a, with a huge port and airport and a CBD attached to it and almost nothing else. So our hotels are not doing well. What we're doing is we're using the hotels as quarantine facilities um, as a stopgap measure that makes sure that they cover their operating expenses for now. So I think we, we have to be patient uh, and see how this, this thing works out. I think we really deserve, I mean, we will get the pandemic that we deserve, right? If you have a government, a healthcare sector, uh, you've got responsible citizens who care about others more than they care about themselves, then you're going to be fine and then trouble is going to resume, the economy is going to pick up. If you're not, then, you know, we'll, we'll be patient and we wait for your recovery. Perfect. So no, we've got, we just had that over uh, two minutes to go. Does anybody from the other panellists wish to come in with any summary? Well, I was just going to give you an insight on the tourist accommodation um, perspective. In, in Australia, um, we are seeing a huge growth in demand for domestic travel. So as restrictions have eased up, um, as our numbers in new COVID infections have stayed very low and places like Victoria that have had a, um, a, a second wave um, have getting their um, uh, situation under control, um, it's almost impossible to book a common summer period coming up. So I don't think many hotel operators uh, would be in a situation where they wanted to bring long stay residency when they've got um, high levels of demand um, staying pop up. It's probably um, more so in regional areas and, and tourist areas, traditional tourist areas, but we're seeing that also happening in, in CBD locations as people think about spending time in Australia as opposed to traveling overseas, which Australia's, Australians are very good at doing. It. So um, that's a mitigating factor. I'd say one thing we might see next year is probably some of the PBSA operators um, starting to actually look at opening up some of their stock to um, non-students. So um, that's probably, I would say, the, the area where you'd see a, a short-term um, shift, but um, um, when we start seeing students coming back, they will quickly shift back the other way. But I think what that will do is actually help establish the asset class to a degree in, in making an accepted market for renters. Okay, great. And uh, just to sort of finalise, I mean, some of the takeaways here is obviously um, this sector does look uh, very much a viable asset class that's emerging. And, and as Mark's alluded to, with it being emerging in Australia in particular, then the returns in the yield side are, I wouldn't say guaranteed per se, but certainly very uh, encouraging. Uh, I think it's also worth pointing out um, what Regina highlighted on. There are other destinations as well to consider. So diversification in, a, in an uncertain world is is uh, definitely a key factor for portfolio managers, as uh, others have mentioned. But uh, always to get in at the ground level or at early stage, uh, there are those uh, returns. So I do see this being attractive for Chinese investors uh, who have also, despite the geopolitics that's going on, uh, it hasn't really affected so much the day-to-day the -day, uh, real life trade per se. It's more about uh, the talk, but um, you know, the, the traditional trades of wine and beef are still sort of doing doing pretty well, and e-commerce in particular is 
uh, done very well between Australia and China. So I think it's worth noting that um, uh, investors uh, do look at that and look at the stability uh, politics in particular, or the, uh, the stability within a country. And Australia offers a lot of that uh, safety net um, when you look at an investment destination. So with that said, I want to thank all my panelists today. Uh, I apologize that we didn't have more time to, uh, to take and answer more questions from the audience. Um, but I thought it was very and uh, informative. And I think for those who are on the call that are looking at uh, diversifying their portfolio over the next year, then Australia and uh, one or two of the other countries that I mentioned are a great um, uh, thing to, to, to think about seriously with your, with your funds. So with that, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, look out for pbec.com for, uh, sorry, .org um, for the further future events in, in the near future. So thank you once again. Bye-bye everybody. Bye-bye everybody. Mm -hmm.